Welcome to Taste of the Club, the podcast for business owners from the Global Business Owners Network of Business Friendship. This is where you get the insights from founders and investors on their career and personal development. Uh, hello, dear podcast listeners. Today we have um, uh, John with me and um, this is Richard. Um, don't forget to su subscribe on any platform that you have moving forward and uh, click the alarm button so you know when a uh, new um, episode is coming up. We have a very special guest today who has, from my experience, a very interesting travel from where she uh, began and where she is today. Uh, so without further ado, Josephine Montali, tell us, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm Josephine Montali. I'm based in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, I'm originally from Malawi, that's in Central Africa. I came to Scotland many years ago, and now actually I'm a citizen, so I travel between here and in Malawi. I did my PhD in education at Edinburgh University. Um, so since then, I've worked in development countries, like I was coordinating programs in over 10 countries in Africa in the girls' education, uh, supporting girls to be in schools and also uh, influencing government policies on girls' education. And also I did some research work with the uh, University of Glasgow and I've published some uh, academic articles. Uh, why I came into GBO is because I'm also engaged in my charity. I'm the founder of the Charity Child Support Project and it helps the children, especially in Malawi. In fact, it was a direct result of my PhD findings. So that's why I came into GBO. For me, it's a charity and also trying to explore ways in which I can raise money for my children. As we know, it's very difficult to raise money for my children. So for me, I came into that with a business mind that I'm exploring opportunities and see how I can get into businesses that I can also raise money for my children. And also, yeah. So that's my synopsis of my bright background <laughs> the, the short version i'm going to penetrate that a little bit more but what's your main line of business today uh, okay i was exploring actually into real estate because in scotland there is a lot of shortage of um of uh, housing um in fact there were proposals by the government of scotland to uh, construct a lot of houses so i was coming in that mind so it's just this uh, coronavirus has really distracted because we're really getting into that. So that's the area which I'm exploring at the moment. Mm -hmm. did, did you have a background in real estate or was it new for you when, was, when you started? Well, it's not very new. I mean, I'm very interested in real estate because, uh, I mean, in Edinburgh, I've been engaged with, um, like, with the property investment, like I've got my own property, but even in Malawi. But here I was coming, like, it's the first thing, like, it's really new in a way, but I've been very interested in the following up in the, in the investments, yeah. It's probably in the construction area. Okay, I'll, I'll let, John, I'll let you in. I just have one more curious question. For me, starting in Malawi, ending up in Edinburgh, is not a, that's not the common thing. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about how, how did you, why Edinburgh? Uh, Malawi is obvious, but. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, Scotland and Malawi, they have very, very strong historical links. So when yes, I was in Malawi, historical links within oh. Scotland and Malawi because of David Livingstone. So in fact, it's the government of Malawi who sent me here to study, to do my PhD, uh, to be, do my degree. So I ended up doing three degrees in Scotland. Uh -huh. That's why I ended up here in Scotland. There are strong links within Scotland and Malawi. So in those days, they were trying to get students from Malawi to come to Scotland to study. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. You said something that you think that I understood, obviously, about mm -hmm. the connection between Scotland and Malawi. What was Very that? strong. Very strong because of David Livingstone. Many years ago, David Livingstone went to Malawi and he, in fact, uh -huh. there were mis Scottish missionaries who uh, went to Malawi yes. and he set schools in Malawi and he also evangelized the people. Christian. Yes, exactly. Oh, so yes. he was in oh. Malawi. Yes. So we have very, very strong links. With Scotland, very strong. So you see a lot of students, they come out to Scotland to but study. Did, remind me, did he find the source of the Nile? <laughs> well, that's very interesting because even he found 
uh, Lake Malawi, and we are saying local people were there already. So how did he find Lake Malawi? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've always thought about that. Excellent yeah. finding Lake Malawi. I'm like, Lake so Malawi I, was always there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Josephine, I didn't say discover. I said find. If I go to Africa Bye. Okay. and I discover. look for something and I find it, I find it. All right. Okay. It. Huh? In, that, in that context, I'm in an agreement with you. Yes. Okay. He, discuss, he found Lake, Lake yeah. Nyasa and also the Nile. Yes. If okay. you say found, then I'm in agreement with you. But if you say discover, then mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know. I'm very careful with my words. John. Yes. Find yes. yes. I'll, I'll let you in, John, now. Okay? Well, good. I'm, I'm a little upset, Richard, that you think yeah. that you don't understand why someone would want to live in Edinburgh. It's a very beautiful city, and uh, yes. I definitely understand why anyone would want to live there. That's uh, true. Although I'm sure it's quite different to uh, different experiences. Did it really come it. through that I didn't understand why to live in Edinburgh? It was just the <laughs> travel from Malawi to Edinburgh, which yes. is not like London, Paris, exactly. I know. <laughs> well, they're not identical, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, Josephine, it's, it's delightful to meet you. And uh, I, I sometimes work with people who are looking to start up charities. What for you was your decision to go into that sector and how did you get started? Uh, okay, as I say, it was a direct result of my PhD findings. So what happened is when I, when I went to Malawi, for me, I was brought up in urban area, but as I lived with uh, communities in very rural areas, in three areas in Malawi, and women challenged me when I was there. And they said, okay, you come here and you are interviewing us. Many people have already come here and they have gone back. So what are you going to do for us? So for me, it was a challenge because they were saying, okay, you are interviewing, we have all your problems. You're going to write your thesis and then what? And then for me, I took it from there. In fact, what I did right there in Malawi, I bought a lot of artifacts, uh, a lot of uh, locally made things. So I took with me a lot of stuff back to Edinburgh. Then one of the churches, they gave me a table during Edinburgh festivals. So I sat there and I, I sold my stuff. I raised 30 pounds and that was my start of raising money for my charity. And in the end, the people in Scotland, they told me, okay, if you want to raise money, then you register as a charity for accountability. So that's when I registered as a charity. So for me, it was initiated by women themselves in the villages. They challenged me. And I thought, it's true. Researchers come here, they take information, and then what next? It's great that you rose to that challenge. And I love the simplicity of how you got started as well. It yeah. didn't need to be anything complicated. You just found no. some stuff you could sell. You got a table and you started selling stuff. Yes. And you raised yeah. some money. That's wonderful. Yeah. And from, where, did it, where did it go from there then? I mean, you registered your charity. What, what came after that? What came after that is that, uh, we've, of course, we, are, uh, we formed a small working group with uh, some Malawians and also Scottish people. Then we formed a, a small constitution for the charity and then we registered as a charity. Then from there, we already engaged the Scottish public. I gave speeches in schools, in the churches, and also at one point, the Scottish government uh, funded our project. Even the first minister, Jack McConnell, went into Malawi to my project. And just to find out what a Malawian be living in Scotland, engaged in Scotland, in Edinburgh, in Malawi. So he saw the work we're doing there and they gave us money. And in the end, we already did a lot of work in Malawi for the charity. Very, a lot of work, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I, I train and teach presentation skills and public speaking to people. And I know that for a lot of people, when they go into doing something like this, the realization probably is there at some point that you're going to have to stand up and speak about it. As you mentioned, you have to give mm. some speeches and presentations yeah, in various yeah. places. How, how was that? How did you prepare for that? How did you have experience or are you naturally extrovert? What, what was your experience with having to do these presentations? Well, I started this in a small way, like I would go to women's guild. They would invite me, especially churches, go to women's guild and then I would give presentation. So I started in a very small way. Was for me, I cannot say that I was a very confident person speaking, standing in people in Scotland and conveying messages. But I started very small, and then in the end, I saw that well, major schools they were inviting me to speak, and then of course in Scottish Parliament at one point they invited me to talk there, and in the end also in conferences because of my work, I've travelled a lot speaking in conferences, so I gained confidence. So I can say that from there, then I could stand and then present you know, my, my dear speech. But also for me, I saw that uh, I had to research and see what the public want to hear. 
So I knew exactly what the public wanted to hear so that they can see that there is work in the, on the ground. And I found that presenting small, small projects which made an impact, that's what the public wanted to hear. So the more I gave such type of speeches, that's the more people were coming in and say, oh, well, this project has got an impact in Malawi. Right, they want to know what kind of difference your project's going to make. Exactly. Yeah. People are tired of people just giving money. They are very tired without seeing any impact. What they want people to see is what is the money doing on the ground for the people? Is it making a difference? Right. And um, did you mention earlier that you were also going for corporate sponsorships as well? Yes, at the moment, actually, what I was, I was saying is that I'm exploring different ideas, business ideas. How can I engage in a business where I can fund my projects? Because what I find is that, like, like let me give you an example, like a Scottish government, we received a grant from there. But to be, to be frank with you, I was very limited of what I could do with that grant, the way conditions in it. So the, so the end of it, I couldn't go to the community and see what, you know, other things I could have supported. So for me, I'm saying, no, this is my area and I'm really very passionate about my projects. So I'm saying, if I have the money to stand on my own, then I can go there and really impact upon the communities and do the work which communities want me to do. So it sounds like it could be, if you're not already doing it, it could be your, it could be a very good candidate for the GBO think tank to come up with more ideas and plans exactly. for how to, how to get that moving forward exactly. as well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. And that's where I'm looking for very support to see, to see how they are really engage in something very, you know, which can bring finances. And also I'm looking at sustainability. Most of the projects, they are not sustainable. For me, I'm looking at sustainability. If I support communities, you know, it's very difficult supporting communities like in Malawi, where they, they are very, very poor. So it needs at least engaging themselves for some time until they can stand on their own. And for me, that's what I'm looking for, sustainability. Josephine, I'd, I'd like to understand more of your business side. I mean, real estate is such a wide array of different businesses. What, what do you do more exactly? Uh, and, and is there any correlation with what you do in Edinburgh that you can help in Malawi or vice versa? Okay, for me, what I'm looking for, as I say, that in rural estates, there are a lot of government proposals of constructing buildings. Like, well, let me give an example. Um, just two, is it two months ago? I think it was in February. There was a very good advert and it was about the way saying that, okay, here is the land and also the, here is the infrastructure and want someone to come in and invest in that, construct, you know, they had all the plan, construct 11 flats, and what they wanted is someone to bring in 500,000 pounds to construct that one. And the end product was going to be 2 million something, something like that, where by now, if I get people to come and in and me and construct, engage in a construction business, something like that infrastructure, for me, that's something which I'm really interested in. So there are opportunities in Edinburgh whereby there are infrastructures, but they are dilapidated and the government wants to turn that into a residential or something useful. And they're inviting investors to come in and engage with us. That's what I'm very interested upon, yeah. So it's, it's mainly your real estate business is mainly within in, in uh, public subsidized exactly. building idea. I mean, we have that same thing in Sweden. Is yeah. that a thing in Malawi or it, 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 does it have that kind of interest? Oh, yes. Oh. Even in Malawi, so much so. Oh, yes. In Malawi, oh, so much so. In fact, one of the government's proposals is infrastructure. Because in Malawi, we don't have good infrastructure and the, the government is really proposing that people going in and getting land and develop, especially the urban areas. That's what the government calls. Oh, yes. In Malawi, there's a lot of opportunities, very much so. And what is the setup? Do you, do you have, I mean, you, uh, the government is only doing part of things. Where do you find the rest of the funding for the projects? So you use your own money or do you find funding some? Uh, your own money. As I'm, I'm talking, I, I, as I'm talking now, I've got land already and huh. which I want to develop very yeah. much so, but I need finances. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, there's, well, there's, a, there's a great opportunity to try to find that kind of uh, knowledge and and mm. possibilities in the gbo network yeah good partnerships can help as well with that kind of thing too right? oh, okay mm -hmm. yeah sometimes yeah. maybe a joint venture could be a, a good thing to explore and that's what i've been looking for a joint venture that's what i've been looking for yes mm -hmm. and that's why i even engaged with uh what's the name of uh oh dear hey, louis yeah louis 
That's why I was engaging with her to find out if I can find a joint venture with someone and say, okay, here I am. For Josephine, doesn't have really capital to start this, but why I'm bringing this issue, like I'm bringing opportunities for you or land or anything, and then how can we engage together in a joint venture? Is that, that's what I'm looking for exactly. That is point on, yeah. Spot right. on. Money is never really the issue. It's always really resourcefulness, isn't it? So it's always yeah. your, your willingness to, to make something happen. Yeah. And really that starts with having the vision. And I think it also starts with having passion for it. And we get a yeah. sense of the passion that you have for the things that you do. Yeah. From how you every every time I talk with venture capitalists or people with private money or whatever, people mm. working with this, they always say, money is not the problem. We need some people who really wants to do the the, the job uh, okay yeah i think sometimes it's the commitment and the passion yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm a little bit curious of malawi because obviously it's not congo or south africa or egypt no I mean, it's in africa uh tell, tell me some some something about malawi what's unique what's special what's different well, as you can see, Malawi is a warm heart of Africa. You can see in me. <laughs> um, Malawi is uh, one of the poorest countries in the world. Very, very poor. When I say poor, I mean uh, GDP is very, very low. Every time I travel in Malawi, you can just see how underdeveloped the country is. So that is one of the issues. Secondly, is a country which has been peaceful for a long time. And a lot of investors really want to go to Malawi because it's a peaceful country and a lot of opportunities there. So I can say that, in fact, the government has produced even a booklet. I've got something, a booklet, which has outlined investors who can go to Malawi and invest in the country. So I've got the booklet, which I got last year when the president visited Edinburgh. The president himself visited Edinburgh, I think, in two years ago, 2018, and I was there. And he's encouraging Malawians to invest in Malawi. So they gave us a copy of a booklet. So I've got that one with me where they have outlining opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities in Malawi. That one is for sure. Even construction of uh, clinics, even uh, schools, a lot. Even in the agricultural program, a lot mining, a lot of uh, opportunities there are in Malawi. That's what I can say. And uh, that's the second. Third, third, we depend a lot in Malawi on a donor aid, very much. So Britain is one of the donor aid, which helps in Malawi at the moment. Yeah, I find this super interesting because, I mean, it's it's... It's located in between Mozambique and in Swedish called Tanzania. Yeah. Uh, how, how come it has become, it has stayed peaceful? Because that's not what the, the, the history of the region suggests. I know, because we had an autocratic president who was there for 40 years and he was very tough in Malawi. In fact, he, a lot of us were even scared to speak about Malawi because he was auto, very autocratic. So. People, I think in Malawi, they are so disciplined because of that. But also we must remember that there is a lot of influence of the Scottish missionaries. They did a lot of tremendous work with Christianity in Malawi. So somehow we have, we have never had like a war in Malawi, never. It's a mm. very peaceful country. Apart from demonstrations there and there because of elections, people demonstrated, but not war as such, no. We have mm. never had such things. And it's true, people really want and say, Malawi is an exception. There have been a war around it, but not in Malawi. Very peaceful up to now. Yeah. yeah the, very reason, the reason is the, the national tradition of being very disciplined. Is that what you say? Yes, it was uh, the, the president was very autocratic, autocratic and emphasized on discipline. And if you messed about, oh my goodness, we're going to pay for it <laughs> for mm. 40 years. Mm. So I think if people lived in fear. So after, and from that, I think people now are coming out. Now you see Malawians, at least they can come out and speak out. Otherwise, Malawians, they're very quiet wherever they, were, they went. Mm -hmm. but so it is, it has really meant peaceful. But also, as I said, it's one of the poorest countries in the world and we depend so much on donor aid. So people are, and 85% of people live in rural areas. Only 15% live in urban areas. So 85, they are just in rural areas there, living on rural, so you can imagine what's going on, yeah. How big, how big is Malawi? Well, it's not, well, it's not you, you mean population or what? No, well, population, land size. Okay, I think it's three quarters is land and one quarter is lakes. They have got a big lake there. Mm -hmm. So in fact, yeah, we are famous because of Lake Malawi. 
That's one of the things that are famous about Malawi. But the population at the moment is about 14 million. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the Malawi, it depends so much on agriculture. Yeah. So it's, it's the, the main source of income is agriculture. There are no, it's no oil or minerals or diamonds. There are, min, there, are min, there are minerals in that uh, pamphlet, which I'm talking about, they have already mentioned about minerals as well, exploring minerals in Malawi. So they are exploring that. I think they have found that we have got some minerals in Malawi. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely, yes, yeah. So there's definitely op opportunity there and, uh, and an opportunity mm -hmm. for fiscal growth as well. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted yeah. to ask you that, um, I'm a big believer that uh, giving is a, a really important part of life and essential for life balance. And yeah, I, I regularly come across people who, who don't generally don't take time to think about it. A lot of people do a standard or they have their direct habits, but not always giving or, or putting stuff uh, out there regularly and, and really thinking about their service and contribution. Mm -hmm. And they might be interested to find out how they can get involved with some of the work that you're doing how, how mm. do you encourage somebody to to get involved how could they get involved and support what you're doing well um for me what I, the way what i would like people to support me with as i've mentioned in malawi of course i encourage local communities like volunteership and also like just to get people be interested to engage not with the money resources i mean sometimes we, 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 use, we use local resources but you not know, with money, but volunteership in Malawi, but also in Malawi, we influence policies with the government. Many times I've worked with the government trying to influence policy to help some of the projects in rural areas. But you see that you're talking with the government, but it's still uh, clinics are in disarray, schools are in disarray. That's when now donors from external donors, they come in to help. But at the same time, it's the government's schools, it's government schools, so you have to work with the government. So at local level, I work with the government and the communities. At international level, that's where I come now to advocate about the needs of people in Malawi. That's where I come up to speak about the projects in Malawi and then to get people to help with financially. That's what I've been doing for years on end. But as I've mentioned, it's not sustainable at all. And I've seen that there are a lot of challenges around and it's very difficult to raise money. And that's why I keep on going back to my work and then you do some work and then come back to my church. If you see my CV, it's like I'm going to do my work, then come back to my church. Because for me, my passion is my charity. Even if I get into a good job, my passion really, where I feel happy that I've done something is my charity because that's my calling for me. It's my ministry. So for me, I, internationally, I want people to support me raising money for my charity. But for me, I'm looking at sustainable. And that's why joint ventures for me is very, very important. Then I'll be able to stand, I've got the money then I can go there and support people on the ground. And that's what I'm looking for. And that's my passion. And, and I think it is a lot of your, your passion for what you do that makes it an uh, attractive mm. prospect to get involved and want to help there as well. As I well, said, so the, mm. the commitment and passion from the person leading is yeah. one of the most important elements. And that does come ex across. Ex ex exactly, exactly. And to be frank with you, I mean, most of the times I've used my own money. Just last month, I sent some money to the elderly people because of COVID, whatever. These people, they are in urban areas, but living in dire poverty. I've got even some videos, which I can send you if you want. And they said, okay, this is something you can give to the people. So for me, to be frank, that is my passion. But where do I get money to do that? <laughs> That's where the challenge comes in. <laughs> let, let, let's see if we can find anyone listening to the podcast in, in GBO or otherwise to support you. You, you, you came to, to Edinburgh to study. When was that? Oh, that was oh, years ago when I did my, I got my PhD in 2001. That's when I, I got my PhD. Yeah. So it has been a long time. Yeah. And, and from your experience, did, did you visit Scotland before? Or was that the first time when you... No, when it, you was the, it was the first time. In fact, I visited England at one point, but Scotland was the first time. Okay. So when I came first time, I ran to Blanta because in Malawi we have Blanta city. It was named after David Livingstone. So there's also Blanta in Scotland. So oh. when I arrived, my goodness, I saw some Scottish people, missionaries and visited a lot of places. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, it was the first I mean, time. It's, it's always, for me, it's always interesting when you do that kind of life journey to see, uh, because my, 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 my perspective to having worked in 30 different countries over my career is that we have a tendency as human beings to look for differences, but 
if you if you try a little bit harder, the similarities are far, far, far bigger. Nine oh, yes. one than the differences. Having that said, just for fun, what was the biggest difference when you came to Scotland and what are the biggest similarities? Let's start with the difference because they are usually more fun. There were many things different culturally, you know, culturally coming here, culturally things were very, very different. I'll give an example. In Malawi, we are very free people. And he, usually we just visit one another. We are very warm, things like that. Then I came here. One day I, I stayed for, 20, for 48 hours. I had nowhere else to go. Okay. I rang one of my friends and she looked in the diary and she gave me two weeks appointment. This is a friend, close friend, two weeks appointment just to visit her. And me, I wanted to visit her the same day. But I said, oh, let me check my diary. Two weeks. I just went back to bed and slept. Those are some of the shocking things I found <laughs> when I came. Yeah, and of course, and of course, seeing that in Scotland, the people are so, ad, I mean, they're not a disadvantage like in Malawi. In Malawi, when you talk about poverty, it's real poverty. Now you come here, people are saying we are poor, and they are looking at them and say, do you really know what the poverty is? Mm -hmm. you're, you're still eating, you've got a nice house, you're sleeping, and you're saying you are poor. Those are some of the things, honestly, they have really shocked me so much. Mm. In Malawi, when you say poverty, it is real poverty. And here they are saying, oh, we are poor. What? <laughs> you are poor. <laughs> always relative, right? It's, it's, it's always relative. So I had a conversation with some of me, my Italian and Spanish colleagues in GDO, because this corona situation and there's this new rule in Sweden. I mean, I know we're a bit different from everyone else, yeah. but... But uh, there, there's this new rule that you, you, uh, you are not allowed to go closer than two meters to each other. Yeah. Uh, but for a Swedish person, culturally, that's very interesting because it means that you will come three meters closer than you usually are. Mm. And that's very, very interesting because in Malawi, the government, the president was, was adapting the same system of the West where they are saying, okay, we are going to lock down people for 21 days. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, you're going to lock down in communities where people are very poor. It's every day they're looking for survival. How can you lock down a child who is heading a family? We've got a child-headed household, poor children staying on their own. You are mm -hmm. locking them in for 21 days. There was a bit of a, a lot of uproar and a lot of demonstrations. Mm -hmm. And it, is, it was canceled. Up until now, they canceled the lockdown. Mm -hmm. They canceled. Because people, they're saying, you're going to lock down poor people. What incentives are there? Here is different. People are receiving some incentives. There are some food uh, banks. Really in Malawi, good. there is nothing. No, it's a really You're good You're locking down the people. No, I never thought of that because locking down means to just go to the store, you buy stuff, and you stay in for, for, for two, three weeks. Yeah, that but people work. in rural areas, where they are in rural areas, where they are going to the fields to get food every day, it's from mouth, you know, things like that. You cannot lock them down. Mm. Where are they going to eat? Hunger is going to kill them more than COVID-19. Exactly. In a country like Malawi, you can't do that. No. Otherwise, you have to come up with a package. We're going to lock you down, but this is the food for you for 21 days. And at the moment, there isn't the infrastructure to support that there, by the sounds of it. Exactly. There's no money, enough to support that type of thing. So they scrapped the whole thing because the government, they couldn't handle People, they protested. They say, how can you lock down people with poverty? But what did, are they going to eat without any incentives, without any food? But did, did you culturally find things that are very similar, because, except for the obvious? Oh, of course. I mean, in the Church of Scotland, this way, very similar. Because in Malawi, the Church of Scotland, even the hymns are the same. Because the Scottish minister, they really influenced in Malawi. So you go to a church in Malawi, English service, you find the Scottish hymns. Even the Scottish minister, some of them, they are in Malawi. And then the school system is the same. Education system, we adapted colonial education system, which is the same. Uh -huh. So things like that, they, are, they were similar, yes, yeah. Is, is English the second language from all the other languages in Malawi? Oh, yes, yes. And in fact, in primary school, you learn English. So, oh, oh yes, from primary school, you learn English. So, oh, yes, definitely. And our curricula, curriculum is in English and also local language, uh -huh. yeah. So we because just adapt, like, adapted the colonial system of education. Because it's like 20 or 30 different languages in Malawi, isn't it? No, only seven. It's a small country. Okay. Yeah, at seven only. Seven. It's only. a small country. 
Yeah, it's a small country, yes. Uh, but it's a lot of languages. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, yes. Still, yeah. still no, I, I read once and I was really surprised by that, that Swedish is one of the, I think one of the 50 biggest languages in the world. And I was thinking, mm. well, it's small, it's just 10 million people. But then I realized that there are over 2,000 languages spoken in the world. In Sweden? Yeah. No, no, in the world. Oh, to, oh yes. And That's in why you, you end up high in statistics. Yes, yeah. In Nigeria, I think there are more than 200 languages in Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, I, I wonder if you, just to sort of change path a little bit, if you could share with us, uh, we mentioned about your transition to living in Edinburgh, and you, you're very well established there now, but what, what are the things that you love particularly about living in Edinburgh and Scotland? Well, I find that the people are very friendly for me. I have met very, very good Scottish people. In fact, one of them even sponsored, two of them sponsored for my PhD program in the end. So I found very, very good Scottish people, very friendly, very supportive. They have supported me very much with my charity, very, very much over the years, giving money, supporting in different ways. That's one of the things which I really charge me so much. Very, very supportive. That's one of the things I like, I like about Scotland. And also I'm used to the way of life. I really like living in Scotland and living in England very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You also share the, the, the hesitance to being pro-English. <laughs> easy now easy now <laughs> i might not live in england but you know I, well, it might <laughs> be if you, if you don't like it john where in england are you from yeah I'm i was sorry. born in manchester but i i lived ah. uh, lived all over the uk mostly lived around the london area for most of my life which is why i don't sound like ah, okay. at all so much yeah that's good. Mm. Sorry no, for that, yeah. John. We're just trying to make some fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I don't get too upset about it. Well, I'll try harder next time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josephine, when, when, when you don't work, what do you do for fun? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I like going to the gym. I like going to the gym. I like meeting friends. I like reading a lot. I'm the person who engages so much with people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Josephine, well, your inspiration, I mean, where, where do you find inspiration from people? Who do you listen to? Who do you read? Well, what can you recommend? Well, I've got very, very good people in Scotland. I mean, there are some Scottish missionaries, some universities, some of my friends around whom we have done a PhD program. So that's where I get my inspiration from. But also, some people also who have been engaged in good work. I know that uh, there are some people in Scotland, uh, Annie Clog, who has been involved in the charitable work. So I also get information from them because I've met some of the uh, high profile people in Scotland. So they have also influenced me so much. In fact, one of them, even in Cherry Blair, at one point, she was a patron of my one of the projects. So I know that it may be my friend John Bo. <laughs> We'll be thinking, <laughs> but some of very influential people, they have already supported me and they have gotten, oh, if people can support me, it means they are seeing that there is something valuable in this, what I'm doing. Well, for me, I, I've done a lot of international travel in my life. I, I spent 12 years as a flight attendant with British Airways. So I saw a lot of the world. And always one of the most interesting things for me was different cuisines from different cultures and countries. Oh, yes. What, what's some of the cuisine that uh, would be maybe traditional for Malawi that maybe stuff that you would, if you were having a Malawi an evening to introduce people to it, that you might make yourself? Malawi cuisine. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we have got this uh, maize meal, stuff which we make into stiff porridge. And then we eat with the beans, we eat with the meat, we eat of whatever vegetables. In Malawi, our cooking, we don't put a lot of spices in it. It's very plain, but a lot of tomatoes and onions. But the traditional food is maize meal flour. Mm -hmm. That's the traditional food. So, so if I come to Sweden, I'll make that for you. <laughs> so, how do you get on with traditional scottish food uh, on that subject have you tried haggis yes <laughs> oh yes i've tried haggis uh, but uh, i've all tried the scottish yeah, yes haggis i've tried yes but also with uh, my project actually we, we used to have african breakfast which raised funds for my project so i, I would cook african dishes and invite scottish people have one eat and then they will donate money and it was very very good it was an annual event 
It was very good. So I've done all that. Oh, I've done that for fundraising here. Maybe, maybe for transparency, can you explain to our listeners what haggis is so they know the, the level of uh, what it is? Oh, haggis, I think there are a lot of things there. They, some they say there's um, pigs <laughs> inside of pigs. Some they say they put a ears, nose, so you don't want to know what you eat when you eat haggis. <laughs> <laughs> my, you my, just have to eat it. <laughs> more, I like it. more precise, John. I, I just have an idea of what it is. Uh, yeah, it, it's awful. I mean, it, it's kind of a minced, <laughs> minced awful so, uh, with, with, um, with seasoning, with spices. Um, for me, I, I really like it, but you're probably right. If, if you knew exactly what was in it, you might not eat it. But no. I think, I think yeah. that's true. <laughs> that's true that's a lot true. of the time. Although there is a, there is a beautiful <laughs> coffee, coffee bar restaurant in, uh, in Edinburgh that does a vegetarian or vegan haggis. And that is actually really oh, nice. Uh, so that, that might be preferable to some people. <laughs> but, that's uh, like saying vegan yeah. sausage there's, there's, or vegan beef. Uh, there's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, once that's I true. learned you... Once we, I have, we, have sim- we have a similar dish in Sweden, actually, called pölsa, but it's, it's uh, you, you mince everything that you don't want to eat whole. Uh, uh, okay. But in, in Scotland, I think you mince everything and then you cook it inside a pig's stomach. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah know. it's the same kind of thing. It's co- cooked inside a sort of uh, skin, like a, yeah. like a sausage skin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I ate that haggis once. I don't eat it because, you know, I'm not sure what they put inside. I've heard different stories. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any knowledge about strange Swedish food? No, I haven't stated to know. I haven't. Have you heard about Sylvströmming, sour herring? No, no. Okay. Sour herring. Look it up on YouTube. It's really interesting because there is a, there's a whole group of YouTube's mm. videos where Americans or English people or people from other countries open a jar of sour herring, which uh, is sour. herring herring from last year, yeah. or for the connoisseur the year before that or before that, which is mm. fermented inside of a a a, a, a can. So mm. sometimes the real connoisseurs they like it when it's like a football, like this, ah, and you wow. open it and, well, let's say any French or Swiss mm. cheese is an amateur compared to the mm. fragrance you get from opening the, the jar. But yeah, my, my mouth is not watering, Richard. No. Okay. Wow, <laughs> I'll check it. I'll check on the internet. <laughs> I'll check on the web. That could be one of those challenges they do on that jungle show, right? Where they have yeah, to eat I'll, weird foods. You know what, I'll send, I'll send you guys some links and maybe, <laughs> maybe you could put a link down yeah. below the YouTube thing or something where you can have mm. the sour herring experience I'll, I'll send a link to you guys. okay the whole <laughs> process by mm. my wife loves it and i hated it from the beginning but mm. i copied the process and i said i'll be in command of the process i'm going to be the one opening the jar mm. because before she opened the jar and i went to the table and the the, the smell of the thing came to me but when i opened the jar Mm. The, the 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 sense i mean the the way you you feel mm. fragrances or or smell actually yeah. it it goes away after a couple of minutes so if you open the jar you neutralize mm. this and then there's only the taste left mm-hmm. That's, that makes it, it far more yeah yeah, yeah. Jo- josephine if someone's visiting edinburgh for the first time and mm. maybe as your guest what's the one place that you would take them to that they have to see and where's the place you would most want to take them out to eat? Well, I'll take them to Edinburgh Castle so they can see Edinburgh Castle and the Holyrood House and also the Parliament. Those are very interesting places to see. Eating places, there are a lot of nice eating places in Edinburgh. (laughs) I like the, I used to like Chinese, but no, I think uh, there's one place which I would take them what is this place whereby they have like over 20 dishes at one go so you tested different dishes oh, it's in here i know where it is but i'll take someone there because oh mm, they will love it different dishes from different countries over 20 dishes mm. that's a place where i'll take someone that sounds fantastic i'd like yeah. to go there myself yeah 
But what about if they, what about if someone is visiting Malawi and uh, is it somewhere that people might go as a tourist? And if they do, where's the place that they should definitely go? Oh, definitely they have to visit Lake Malawi. They have to go to Mangochi. That one, oh, they are going to enjoy the cuisine. They are going to enjoy the lake. They are going to enjoy the famous, popular, delicious fish, Chambo. That a place I would definitely take them, Lake Malawi, definitely. Sounds yes. good. And definitely, Lake Malawi is something you can't miss, no. That would be a good experience. Fresh water, oh. See, your descriptions of food do have my mouth watering. Rich's description of the sour herring. <laughs> no, 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 that one, that one, I'm going to check on internet, but mm -mm. <laughs> it's, Let's say, to put it mildly, sour herring is an acquired taste. Mm. Yeah, I hear that about many foods that are kind of revolting, but, uh, yeah. but I say that uh, uh, ca caviar is one of the things that I have discovered has become a bit more of a acquired taste. Not that I get to eat it very often, but, uh, mm. but when I have, it's, like, it's something I would have spat yeah. out years ago and now uh, yeah, I can yeah. enjoy it. So it is true in some cases. Mm. Uh, it's so sad for you that you have to train to eat caviar. <laughs> I wasn't, I, I don't come from that kind of background where it's already in my palate. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. So, Josephine, it's, had, it's been great to uh, have you on the podcast. Okay. You have, uh, made an uh, amazing journey and we're really yeah. happy to have you with GBO in, in Edinburgh. Yes. Um, so, um, thank you very much. And to our okay. listeners, don't okay. forget to subscribe and hit the alert button so oh, okay. that you will get notified when when um, a new episode is coming up thank you for inviting me that was lovely okay it's been yes. a joy yeah. been an inspiration are you a game changer a startup founder a high impact investor entrepreneurial minded a business owner with a global mindset welcome to the world of global business owners i'm richard global president of GBO. We are a rapidly expanding international business networking club with established chapters in 24 cities and more than 650 members worldwide. Among our esteemed members are many accomplished business owners, which include partners of prodigious law firms, founders of high-tech startups, elite yacht brokers and experienced investors, to name a few. We created GBO to help people like you facilitate lifelong business friendships, to give leaders a platform to share knowledge, to allow for the open discussion of ideas and to create business opportunities for GBO members around the world. Experience a different kind of business network, one that doesn't come with strict membership rules or expensive club fees. GBO offers a relaxed social environment that connects people with knowledge, knowledge with ideas, and ideas with opportunities. We invite you to join us in building a significant global business network with the goal to forge a community of 50,000 global members in 500 city chapters all around the world, as GBO becomes a key community in the global business environment. Begin your journey today and join us as an honored guest at one of the next local chapter meetings in your city to experience the spirit and philosophy of GBO. Simply complete the guest request form on our website and one of our dedicated guest managers will be in contact with you to assist you in booking a guest seat and to answer any questions. I hope to see you at the next GBO event. Welcome to GBO. Welcome by GBO. Bienvenido a GBO. Welcome to GBO. Welcome by GBO. Welcome to GBO. Welcome to GBO.